Good afternoon and aloha. Welcome to Queen's West Oahu Virtual Speaking of Health Lecture Series. My name is Eric Barsatan, and I'm the Manager of Physician Relations and Medical Staff Services here at the Queen's Medical Center, West Oahu. The title for today's Speaking of Health Lecture is Active Adult Athletes, Injury Prevention and Treatment. Right now and throughout the presentation, you could ask all of yours to be on mute. And if you have any questions, please type your questions question in the chat box and our speaker will answer them at the end of his presentation. At this time, I'm honored and privileged to introduce our speaker. Dr. William Van der, Reis, oh, Van der Rice, excuse me, uh, attended Well Cornell Medical College and for his residency, he went to the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine for orthopedic surgery. His fellowship is on the advanced orthopedic and sports medicine and he's certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. Welcome, Dr. Van der Rice. You may now proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're located. Um, as Eric mentioned, I am an orthopedic surgeon and I specialize in sports medicine and what we call arthroscopic surgery. That's a type of surgical procedure where we use little tiny holes rather than making full incisions to fix damaged cartilage, ligaments, and bones. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about sports injuries in the adult athlete. We'll talk a little bit about how those injuries occur, um, what those injuries are, how those injuries are treated, and then just some general guidelines about getting back into activity and how, I, how to prevent those injuries from occurring in the first place. So generally speaking, we are at our physical and athletic peak when we're in our 20s and early 30s. And that's why most professional athletes, whether they're soccer players or baseball players or basketball players, have their greatest success in their 20s and early 30s. There are certainly some exceptions. You can look at someone like Tom Brady, who's in his late 40s playing professional football. But for the average person, you're at your most powerful and fastest when you're in your 20s. As we age, some things decline, but others improve. So doing sports that involve endurance, like running, cycling, swimming, you can actually peak well into your 40s, which is why you see a lot of high level runners, triathletes, and cyclists that are a little bit older than your typical professional athlete. Once we transition out of our 40s into our 50s and 60s, you can remain very physically active and athletically capable, but you're probably better off in a different type of sport environment, more low impact type sports like tennis, golf, swimming, cycling, things that are less likely to need a strong, powerful type movement like basketball. So one of the challenges as an adult athlete is we have other things going on in our lives. When you're young, Maybe you're going to school, but there's lots of free time to participate in athletics and quite often there's athletic time built into your school day or your life schedule. As an adult, we have jobs, we have families, we have other distractions that keep us from having the opportunity to participate in sports. So when you do get that opportunity, you want to make sure that if you've had a significant amount of time off that you're careful and how you get back into that type of activity. So just some general guidelines that can help getting back into sports and reduce the risk of having an injury. The first is to start out with something that you're capable of completing. So if it's running, start out with just a short five minute run. If it's riding a bike, just do that for five, 10, 15 minutes. If it's playing tennis, Limit it to just a few games. What you wanna do is you wanna do it for a short period of time, something that you feel like you're certain to accomplish, and that'll make you feel better about A, you're back into that activity, and B, you get a sense of accomplishment because you've completed that activity. Once you've chosen whatever activity it is you want to do, try to bake it into your daily schedule. It's very hard when you have a full-time job and a family and things going on, to find time for yourself to exercise. But if you say, I'm gonna take Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, 30 minutes from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. to dedicate to my particular activity, 
it's much easier to maintain that activity rather than just saying, well, I'm going to wait until I have 30 minutes free because in reality, we have very little free time these days and that's harder to do. So just put something in your weekly schedule and then try to stick to it. Another thing that's helpful, it sounds kind of silly, is to prep the night before. But let's say if you're going to be a cyclist, put your helmet and your glasses and your shoes and your clothes out the night before so that that next morning when you get up to do that activity, you have one less excuse to not do it. So just prepping the night before reduces the chances of you not wanting to go back and do it. The next thing is to commit to a one month challenge. And that means that you say, okay, I'm not gonna necessarily plan to do this activity for the next year. I'm gonna set an attainable goal. I'm gonna do this activity two or three times a week for the next four weeks. And it's a much easier goal to obtain than say, New Year's resolution is I'm gonna play tennis for the next year so I can lose X amount of weight. That's a much more difficult goal to achieve. But if you say, I'm gonna play twice a week for the next four weeks, it's much easier to achieve. So you're more likely to continue. And finally, if it's an activity that you can do with someone else, it makes it much more likely that you're gonna to continue to pursue that activity. So find an exercise partner, someone that can motivate you, you can motivate them. It makes it much more likely that you're gonna persist in that activity. And I should mention, as Eric said, if there's questions that come up, please write them down, put them in the chat box, and we'll have plenty of time at the end to answer questions. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what these injuries are and how we treat these injuries. And we'll talk a little bit about shoulder, elbow, hip, knee, and ankle injuries. And this is not necessarily a comprehensive list of all sporting related activities, but these are the more common things that we see. So in the shoulder, um, by far the most common that problem that I see is issues related to the rotator cuff. So if you look at this image, the rotator cuff is a group of four muscles and tendons, one in the front of the shoulder, one on the top of the shoulder, and two behind. And those muscles and tendons help you with activities over the shoulder. So below the shoulder level, you use your big pectoral muscles and your deltoid muscles. Once you're above the shoulder, these sorts of movements, you use the tendons of the rotator cuff. As we age, the little joint on the top of the shoulder, right in here, starts to wear out and little bumps develop on the bottom of that bone that's called the acromion or cap of the shoulder. Those little bumps rub on the tendons of the rotator cuff when we're doing those overhead activities and you create an inflammation or a tendonitis. If that process continues and those little bone spurs rub and rub and rub, you can eventually get what we call a partial tear of the rotator cuff, meaning it's cutting part way through the tendon. And then if it continues further, you could even cut all the way through the tendon and get a full rotator cuff tear. So for the patients that have that first or the second problem, either a tendonitis or a partial tear, we treat that, generally speaking, non-surgically. So 80% of the time, people don't need surgery. We do things like physical therapy, modifying your activities, exercises at home, and sometimes injections of what's called cortisone to reduce inflammation. 80% of the time, the symptoms go away and you get to go back to your normal activities. 20% of the time, we do what's called arthroscopic surgery, which is where we make little tiny holes and we physically clean, off that, clean out that inflammation and remove those little bone spurs. And then people go through physical therapy. It takes about three months. And then they generally speaking, they get back to activity. If the tendon's actually torn, so cut all the way through, in those cases, 90% of the time we need to fix it because the tear will, generally speaking, get bigger and bigger and bigger over time and can lead to more problems down the road. That surgery is also done what we call arthroscopically, so with three little tiny holes, repair the tendon back down to the bone, and that takes about six months to fully recover. Another issue we see in the shoulder is related to what's called the biceps tendon, the tendon 
that sits right in the front. And often when the rotator cuff is damaged, the biceps is also damaged. Similar to the rotator cuff, it's more, if it's more of an inflammatory problem, to treat with medications, therapy, and injections. If it's actually torn or severely damaged, then we can do surgical procedures to either repair or we do what's called a tenodesis, which is where we actually cut the tendon and replace it into a different place. So the second very common problem we see in the shoulder is issues related to what's called the labrum. So the labrum is a cartilage that circles around the socket. And essentially what it does is it connects to the ligaments that hold the shoulder in place. If that labrum is damaged, meaning you do an activity, whether it's throwing or swimming, and you separate or tear that labrum, you uh, end up with the ball moving around more than it should. When the ball is moving around more than it should, it creates pain and inflammation of the lining of the shoulder and the rotator cuff. Quite often we can uh, control that non-surgically by strengthening all the big muscles in the shoulder to minimize that extra movement that's occurring from the ball moving around. If that doesn't work, then we can arthroscopically, meaning making little holes, put a camera inside the shoulder, we actually repair or stabilize that labrum. That's an outpatient procedure. It takes about an hour. You do about six weeks of physical therapy. And by three months, the shoulder feels strong, stable, and you can get back to your activities. So the elbow is made up of three bones, the humerus bone, which is the upper arm bone, the ulna, which is on the back of the elbow, and the radius, which is on the inside. There are ligaments that support the elbow both on the outside and on the inside. And then there are some muscles, primarily the biceps in the front and the triceps in the back. There are a lot of smaller muscles in the forearm, but really those are the two big muscles that cross the elbow. By far the most common problem we see in uh, people with elbow problems is what's called either tennis elbow or golfer's elbow. They're basically the same problem, just in different parts of the elbow. Tennis elbow is where you get inflammation on the outside of the elbow, right at that knob on the outside of your elbow. Golfer's elbow is where you get inflammation on the knob on the inside of the elbow. And what happens is the tendons that either straighten the wrist or bend the wrist, attach on the outside of the elbow. You get little microscopic tears inside those tendons. They become chronically inflamed. And because the blood flow to the area is not very good, that inflammation persists and lingers. It gives you pain when you lift stuff up, pain when you push stuff away. The good news is that more often than not, we can treat that non-surgically. We use what's called a tennis elbow strap, either on the outside or the inside of the elbow, depending on where the problem is. And that takes stress off the elbow. We also use something called Voltaren gel, V-O-L-T-A-R-E-N. It's an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory like Advil or Aleve, except it's in a gel. And you massage that into the elbow once or twice a day for a few weeks, that inflammation subsides and quite often the pain goes away. If that doesn't work, then we have patients do physical therapy and we can do injections. There are two kinds of injections. One is what's called cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory to take away that pain and inflammation. And the other is a newer treatment called PRP. That stands for platelet-rich plasma. And what we do is we draw your blood, spin it down in a centrifuge, and then take those platelets and inject them into the areas that are damaged. The platelets have what we call growth factors inside. And so those growth factors stimulate new blood vessels to grow into the damaged tissues and they heal. That's quite an effective procedure. It's done in the office. We don't even use anesthesia for it. Rarely, less than 5% of the time, this problem goes on and on. 
and then we do surgical intervention to repair this damaged tissue. As far as the biceps and the triceps, we see injuries that are in one of two categories. The first is a inflammation or a tendonitis of the biceps or the triceps. And the second is a rupture or a tear where the biceps actually pulls off the bone or the triceps pulls off the bone. If it's one of those inflammatory conditions, we can treat it non-surgically, similar to the tennis elbow and the golfer's elbow with anti-inflammatory gels, injections of PRP or cortisone, physical therapy, and most importantly, avoiding those heavy lifting type activities. If they're completely torn, then we do surgery to repair the tendons. We drill through the bone and stitch the tendons back to the bone, either of the biceps or of the triceps. The next thing is called ulnar nerve entrapment. So most people have probably heard of something called carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is where the nerve on the bottom of the wrist called the median nerve gets pinched. And as it gets pinched, you get tingling and numbness in the thumb, index, and middle finger, and weakness when trying to grip objects. If the nerve on the inside of the elbow gets pinched, some people think of it as the funny bone, then you get weakness and tingling into your pinky finger and ring finger, and you actually get weakness of what we call finger abduction, so creating a fan. If you try to support that, that's easy to do, but if you have that ulnar nerve entrapment, people can't do that. If this problem persists, then we do like a carpal tunnel release, we do a cubital tunnel release, which is an outpatient surgery where we remove the pressure off that nerve, and in some cases actually transfer that nerve to a different place in the elbow. That has very good outcomes, but it does take time to recover because the nerve regenerates at about a millimeter a day. So you could imagine that's several hundred millimeters. It can take months for it to improve. Hip injuries are actually relatively uncommon in the adult athlete. And the reason is the hip joint is an inherently stable joint, meaning that the socket, what we call the acetabulum, and the ball fit very tightly into one another. And so, as you can see in the image, that ball sits deep inside the socket, and it's not likely to damage that without a significant injury. We do see injuries to the muscles around the hip. People can develop what we call hip flexor injuries, which is where you stretch the muscles in the front of the hip, or hamstring injuries, where you injure the muscles behind the hip. More often than not, those recover with activity modification, anti-inflammatory medication, physical therapy, stretching, and somewhere between six and eight weeks, the muscle injuries heal. If in some cases the muscle is actually pulled off the bone, the tendon rips off, then we do repair those surgically, but that's very uncommon. Just like in the shoulder, there is a labrum in the hip joint. So right at the edge of the hip socket is a bumper that runs all the way around. And that labrum can be damaged in that athletic activity. If that occurs and patients have a lot of pain that doesn't respond to physical therapy, we can repair that damage arthroscopically, again, using small incisions. Camera goes inside the hip joint and we actually stitch the labrum back to the bone. People go through physical therapy to get mobility after the surgery. And by about three to six months following surgery, they get back to their normal activities. Finally, I did want to mention something called hip impingement. And similar to the shoulder, little bone spurs can build up over time on the ball. We call that cam impingement. On the socket, we call that pincer impingement. And those bones bump into one another when those bone spurs develop. As that occurs, the hip becomes increasingly painful and stiff. We can fix that arthroscopically by shaving down those bone spurs, and that actually accomplishes two very important things. The first is that it eliminates the pain and improves the mobility, and second, it reduces the risk of becoming arthritic 
down the road. Knee injuries are very common in adult athletic activities. And there are two main categories of knee injuries. The first is injury to the ligaments, and the second is injury to the meniscus. So there are four major ligaments in the knee, two on the outer aspect of the knee, the medial collateral ligament, or MCL, and the lateral collateral ligament, or LCL. Those are on the outer aspect of the knee. The important point is that they're outside of the central joint. So those have blood flow and they have the ability to heal. So generally speaking, 90% of the time injuries to the MCL on the inside or LCL on the outside heal with a brace, ice, exercises, limiting your activities and somewhere in the six to eight week range, the ligament heals and you get back to your sport. Injuries inside the joint to what's either called the ACL or the PCL are more difficult to treat. And the reason is there's joint fluid. All joints in the body have fluid in them like oil in the car. And when that ligament tears, the, the ends are just sitting there floating around in that fluid and there's no ability for them to reconnect. There's no ability for them to get blood flow back and heal. The PCL, which is in the back of the knee, is most often injured with what we call a direct blow. So car accident, tripping and falling directly onto your knee. Those can be treated non-surgically with a brace. The ACL, on the other hand, usually needs surgery. That occurs with a twisting injury. Initially, you get pain, swelling, those symptoms subside, and the knee actually feels okay. It used to be called a trick knee because it would feel normal and then you'd walk down the street, turn, and the knee would give out. So that's the symptom of a torn ACL, is that the knee gives out or shifts. And the problem is, A, that's painful. B, it can lead to more problems in the knee with other parts. And C, it can increase your risk for getting wear and tear or arthritis down the road. So we fix that problem arthroscopically, meaning little tiny incisions, and make a new ACL. That's done by drilling a tunnel through the bone on the tibia, drilling a tunnel through the bone on the femur, and making a new ACL. We use what's called a graft, and you can do that from the patient themselves, meaning use their hamstring tendon or the tendon in the front of the knee called the patella tendon, or sometimes we use what's called an aloe graft, which is taken from a cadaver, Someone passes away in an injury, we take their tissues, and then we make a new ligament. The difference between an allograft, people always ask as well, am I going to reject that like a kidney or a heart? And the answer is no, because we actually sterilize those grafts. And so the chance of rejection, like you would with a kidney or a heart, is extremely low. The recovery from an ACL surgery takes about six months before people get back to activity and 12 months before you really feel like you're as good as you ever were. Meniscus injuries are very, very common injuries. The meniscus is a cartilage pad that sits between the femur bone and the tibia bone. It's a C-shaped cartilage. There's one on the outside and one on the inside. And the best way to think about, well, what is a meniscus really like? The best analogy is it's kind of like a piece of calamari steak. It's thick, it kind of moves around, it's strong, it has a little bit of give to it. It has no blood flow to it, so it just sits there like a pad. And when you turn or you twist, you can get tears, almost like a hangnail. The tear itself is not what hurts, but when you twist and it pulls where the meniscus attaches to the skin, that can be painful. About 50% of the time after you tear your meniscus, the symptoms fade away. Even though the meniscus doesn't heal, you don't have symptoms associated with it, so you don't need to do anything about it. About 50% of the time, the symptoms don't go away, meaning you get a sharp pain, clicky sensation either on the inside or the outside of the knee. 
And we can fix that again, arthroscopically. So tiny little holes, we put a camera inside the knee and either like a hangnail, we trim out the little torn piece, or if it's more peripheral, meaning on the edge where there is a tiny bit of blood flow, we put stitches in to repair it. That's an outpatient surgery and recovery is anywhere from three to four weeks before we allow people to get back to activities. Ankle injuries are very, very common in sports. It's probably the number one overall most common injury. And by far the number one ankle injury is at what we call a sprained ankle. So in the ankle, you have two big bones above, the tibia and the fibula. The fibula is the little one on the outside. And below you have what's called the talus, which is like a dome, and the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. There are three ligaments on the outside of the ankle and one on the inside that hold it in place. A sprain is where these ligaments either stretch or tear. A grade one, we grade them from one to three, is very mild stress injury where there's no significant stretching. Grade two is where the ligaments actually stretched but not completely torn. And grade three is where the ligaments are completely torn. And the significance of the grading is not necessarily in how we treat it, but in how long it takes to recover. Milder sprains recover more quickly, more severe sprains recover more slowly. There are, you know, most of the time, non-surgical plans for these injuries. We put people in what's called a boot or a cam boot, which holds the ankle nice and still for anywhere from two to four weeks. And then we transition to a brace that prevents that side to side rolling, but allows the ankle to move up and down. That allows the patient to get back to activity while prevent it from being re-injured. If it's a grade one injury, they usually heal by four weeks. Grade three injuries can take up to three months to heal. Tendon injuries are less common, but in some ways more substantial. The most common tendon injury is to what's called the Achilles tendon, which is that big one in the back of the ankle. It connects the calf muscle to the heel bone. If that is strained or inflamed, that can recover non-surgically with immobilization in a boot, anti-inflammatory medication, non-impact exercise, and physical therapy. If on the other hand, it's completely torn, those injuries more often than not, we treat surgically. There are uh, some cases in which we treat them non-optively. There is some evidence now saying that non-optive treatment can show equally good outcomes. The difference is there's a slightly higher chance of re-rupture with the non-surgical treatment, and the recovery process takes a little longer with the non-surgical treatment. I also did want to mention what's called the plantar fascia. So if, if you look at the foot from the side, there's a band of tissue that connects the heel bone to the toes. And if the bones of the foot are held in an arch. So this fascia supports that arch. If you were to cut the plantar fascia in half, this arch would flatten down. Not completely, but it would definitely come down, that would put a lot more strain across the foot and make it more difficult to function. When we walk, this plantar fascia stretches. And through running, jumping, physical activity, you can get micro tears inside the fascia. They usually occur in the back of the fascia near the heel bone. That's called plantar fasciitis or inflammation of the plantar fascia. People complain when they get out of bed with that first step that it's really painful. And the reason is when you are active during the day, the blood flow to that area increases and the symptoms tend to subside. When you go to bed at night, your foot flexes down and so the arch shortens up. You take that first step in the morning and it stretches right back out and that's very painful. Usually we can treat the plantar fascia issues non-surgically with stretching when you get out of bed in the morning, when you go to bed at night, with splints 
that hold the foot out at nighttime to keep it from having that shortening effect. Sometimes we do injections of either cortisone or PRP to stimulate healing, and rarely we'll do surgical procedures to remove that damaged tissue and repair the damaged tissue. In some people, you can develop what we call heel spurs, which is in a little extra bony prominence right here. Those heel spurs are a risk factor for getting plantar fasciitis, and we can remove those little bone spurs at the same time. So one of the important things to remember, you know, we've been talking about so many injuries, it makes people say, well, why, why would I wanna participate in sports if I'm gonna get all these injuries? These injuries don't occur in everyone, obviously, but there are some ways to reduce your risk for having a sports-related injury. Number one is to maintain flexibility. So as we age, we become generally stiffer. And so by doing stretching type activities like yoga and Pilates, you can dramatically reduce your risk of having sports-related injuries. The second is to stretch before your activity. So you don't necessarily need to do a full body stretch, but if you're gonna run, make sure to do a lower body stretch. Just for a few minutes, you'll reduce your risk for having a stress-related injury while you're doing your activity. Strengthening your core is very helpful. A, it improves your balance, so you're less likely to hurt yourself if you're playing tennis or playing pickleball, and it reduces the risk for lower back injuries by keeping that abdominal, those abdominal muscles nice and strong. The other thing to consider is if you're gonna do a new sport, let's say you wanna pick up pickleball or tennis or golf, something you haven't necessarily done before, it might be worth investing in some training with either a trainer or a professional to learn how to participate in that sport to reduce your risk for doing something improperly and developing either an acute or an overuse type injury. And lastly, if you do get back into sports, make sure you take some time to recover. So if you're going to play tennis, make sure that you're not playing tennis every single day. Give yourself a day to recover after that activity. So just as an example, popular sports uh, for adults Pickleball is the fastest growing sport, uh, at least in the United States right now. Golf, very popular, cycling, martial arts, weightlifting, gym fitness type activities, tennis, and stand up paddle. So one thing I do want to mention is, despite the fact that these injuries occur, we have the ability to take care of and resolve almost all of them and get people back to activity. And the benefit of participating in some sport as an adult far weighs the uh, risk of getting injured during that sport. There are physical benefits with weight loss, lower blood pressure, lower risk of diabetes, and mental benefits with better sleep cycles and lower rates of depression. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Vander Rice, for the great presentation. Right now, we will proceed with the Q&A or question and answer portion. Again, if you have any questions, please type them in the, chat box, in the chat box right now. So the first question that we have is from Jim. Uh, he did say that you mentioned an ointment to reduce inflammation. He said yeah. that you can't provide that name again and if it's available over the counter. Yes, so it used to be prescription and several years ago it became over the counter. The brand name is Voltaren, V like Victor, O-L-T-A-R-E-N, and it's Voltaren gel. The generic version is called Diclofenac, D-I-C-L-O-F-E-N-A-C gel, and it's sold at Costco, Long, CVS, Rite Aid, any local pharmacy, uh, will have it. It comes in a, what looks like a toothpaste tube, and there's an instructions on how to use it. It's made for external use only, meaning don't put it in your mouth. Um, and it can be applied to the elbow, to the shoulder, to the back, to the knee, to the ankle, any area of inflammation. The general uh, recommendation is to use it twice a day, 
you massage it in for about five minutes and then wash your hands afterwards. If after a week or two of use, you're not noticing any benefit, I wouldn't recommend continuing it, but it is generally a safe medication to use. I would not use it if you're allergic to anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen because it's in the same general family, but it is a very effective and very safe medication. Very good. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the next question is, when should you see a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon like yourself? Is it the level of pain or the duration or how long they have had the pain? What is your recommendation is it, or is it both? So uh, it depends a little bit on where you are, what sort of access to health care you have. Um, just as a, a general rule, if you have an acute injury, meaning something happens, you fall, you hurt yourself, and icing and uh, either Tylenol or ibuprofen is not alleviating that pain, then probably the best option is either to go to an urgent care or an emergency room, or if you have access, to your primary care doctor to get x-rays to make sure you haven't broken something. For more chronic problems, meaning very common thing that I see is someone has shoulder pain and they've had shoulder pain for months and it's difficult to sleep on their side and it's difficult to lift things up overhead. It's not terrible, but it's really annoying. You can go straight to an orthopedic surgeon like myself. There are also primary care doctors that specialize in sports medicine or you can go to your primary care doctor and then they can make a referral. Some of it has to do with uh, insurances as well. I don't wanna go too deep into that, but if you have what's called an HMO, health maintenance organization, they usually want you to go to your primary care doctor first, and then you get a referral to an orthopedic surgeon. Whereas if you have what's called a PPO, then you can go directly to the specialist. So I see patients as a first time all the time, meaning someone has shoulder pain for six weeks and I'm the first provider that they see. And I see people that have gone to their primary care or a physical therapist or a chiropractor, and then they get referred to me. So it's really dependent on your choice and your insurance. Very good, thank you. Next question. Are lower back injuries or strains fairly common for older adults as well? The answer is yes. 90 to 95% of all people will at some point in their life have a lower back episode. Now that doesn't mean that they have horrible problems, but 90 to 95% of adults will at some point have a problem with their lower back. It could be something simple like a muscular strain where you get, you pick up a, uh, gallon of milk and you get a sharp pain in the lower back and you feel like oh, you can't get up out of the chair for a couple of days. Generally, as long as you're not having what we call neurologic symptoms, meaning numbness, tingling, weakness, problems with bowel and bladder function, you can treat that with heat, ice, Voltaren gel, rest, and more often than, more often than not, the symptoms will go away more serious problems with the back, like what we call a herniated disc, where you pick something heavy up or you turn quickly and you get burning or numbing or tingling, what we call sciatica, that's a more serious problem and that you need to notify your doctor about or maybe even go to an urgent care about. As we get even older into our 60s, 70s and 80s, you can develop what we call degenerative disc disease, which is arthritis of the lower back. And in those cases, people have what we call chronic back pain. They just have pain, pain, pain in the lower back on an everyday basis. Those patients are best served seeing what's called a physiatrist, which is a pain, otherwise known as a pain medicine doctor. And those doctors are specialists in treating lower back pain and they do minimally invasive treatments with injections uh, to alleviate that pain. Rarely those patients see a neurosurgeon for surgical intervention. I'm not a back specialist myself, but that's kind of a A to Z of backs. 
Okay, and look at a follow up question to that question that you just answered. Uh, what are your thoughts on massages and or chiropractic adjustments? Are they beneficial? So, uh, massage two two kind of different things. Uh, massage therapy, as long as someone is not being overly aggressive, can be very very helpful. Um, chiropractic treatment can also be very helpful. I um, generally more often than not refer people to physical therapists rather than chiropractors. And that's not necessarily that chiropractors aren't good. It's just that uh, physical therapists tend to work hand in hand um, with orthopedic surgeons. Chiropractors tend to be more individual practitioners, meaning they care for the patient from A to Z. So chiropractors can be wonderful providers. They can provide fantastic care. Um, so I, I would say if you want to try massage therapy, if you want to try chiropractic treatment, that's fine. The, the things, again, speaking specifically to the lower back, if you have what we call neurologic symptoms, numbness, tingling, weakness, loss of bowel or bladder function, I would steer you probably more to an MD who can get an MRI or an X-ray to make sure there isn't something that needs to be addressed on a more urgent basis. When we're dealing with more chronic problems like stiffness, lower back pain, I think a massage therapist, a chiropractor are a wonderful modality. Okay. The next question is, if you have knee pain, how long should you wait to see if it will heal, heal on its own or when it's time to see a doctor? So, again, it de depends a little bit on the origin of the pain. Let's say you're a 35 year old person that has had no particular history of injuries, but over the years, your knee has become a little bit stiff, a little bit swollen. You have pain when you're trying to work out, but it's preventing you from doing things you want to do. I would go and see someone, either your primary care doctor, a sports medicine specialist, or an orthopedic surgeon, because what you don't want that pain to do is to prevent you from being healthy and active. If on the other hand, the pain is more acute, meaning you trip and fall or you twist your knee playing tennis and you get a sharp pain and there's swelling, that's probably something I would see someone sooner rather than later for, because what you want, don't wanna do is have something that's fixable and wait too long and then it's no longer fixable. I'm not saying it's an emergency, but I am saying it's probably worth getting evaluated within a week or two. Okay, and this question looks like from a runner. She said, based on seeing some family members who are no longer able to run after enjoying it for much of their life, of their life, I'm wondering if I should be mixing up my exercise routine now that I'm in my 40s. And do you have a general recommendation, best types of activities that they can do to, live life longer yeah so there are some people that just have the body type and the form that they can run until they're 90 years old and they never develop a pain or a strain in their body but that person is the exception rather than the rule so if you're only running and you're in your 40s you're probably going to be better off starting to at least cross train. And the reason is that impact of running will at some point cause enough wear and tear on the joints to A, potentially develop arthritis and B, potentially limit your ability to exercise. So I'm not saying stop running at all, but what I am saying is the advantage of, of cross training will allow you to keep running on a longer term basis. Before I talk about cross training type activities, I would like to say about running itself. Running in general is better done on flatter ground. Running uphill is okay, but running downhill is really hard on the knee. So if you have the opportunity to run and you can run on flatter surfaces, either on a treadmill or on regular ground or on a high school track, you're gonna put less strain, less strain on your knee than you are running downhill. As far as cross training goes, cycling, elliptical trainer, a rowing machine, 
swimming, any non-impact type cardio exercise is really going to increase the lifespan of your knee. Think of the knee as a car tire. If you drive that car at 90 miles an hour, it's going to wear out a lot faster than if you drive the car two days a week at 40 miles an hour. So running in a safe way and cross training is going to increase the lifespan of your knee. So continue to run as long as you're not having pain and mix in cycling, swimming, uh, rowing machine, any non impact cardio type exercise. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is someone that wear high heels and her question is, are there injuries uh, that can result using high heels similar to sports injuries? So, to some extent, yes, there's high heels and there's high heels, right? You can talk about a, a one inch heel and we can talk about crazy four or five inch heels. So the yes. crazy four or five inch heels are going to increase your chances of an ankle sprain where the ankle is going to roll, particularly if you're going out to dinner and if you have a glass of wine or two and you're maybe not at your best in terms of stability. So as long as you're walking carefully and maybe with not quite the crazy high heel, the chances of having an acute injury are no more than wearing regular shoes. But what we do see in people who wear high heels on an everyday basis for work is problems with the toes. So you can develop arthritis where in your big toe, what we call a metatarsobalangeal joint. Let me just back up for a second here. So this level of the joint here, if you would imagine when you are on high heels is going to see a lot of strain, particularly for the big toe. And you can develop arthritis here. You get pain, bone spurs develop, and that can lead to the need for surgery. So a general guideline would be to wear, if you're wearing heels at work and it's something that you have to do, just wear a slightly lower heel and that will put less strain on that joint. Okay. Oh, that answers the question. Yeah, uh, we have more questions here. Uh, this person has gout and the question is, are some of these injuries, uh, the sports injuries that you mentioned, can it also be caused by gout? So the short answer is no. Uh, the longer answer is that gout in and of itself is, so gout for people who don't know is where joints in the body get little crystals deposited in the fluid. So instead of being nice, normal motor oil, these little sharp crystals build up in the joint. And when they build up, they cause a severe inflammation and it becomes very, very, very painful. Those episodes can be treated with um, medications and injections. But really the most important thing is when someone does develop gout to prevent the episodes from happening because over time, those little crystals will stay in the joint and damage the cartilage and lead to arthritis. So gout has two problems. One is the episodes of pain and two is the long-term damage to the cartilage, not necessarily sport related, but that cartilage wears out, then you develop arthritis and then you have bigger problems depending on the joint, whether it's in the foot or the knee or the hip. So the acute episodes are dealt with medications and injections. And then long-term, you need to see your primary care doctor so they can put you on medications to prevent the episodes from happening. happening. There are medications that we call allopurinol or colchicine that can be used to reduce these episodes. The other thing I would say as a general rule uh, for the person who has gout is there are certain foods and beverages that increase the risk of having those episodes happen, particularly here in Hawaii where everybody loves shrimp. Crustaceans like shrimp, if you consume large volumes of crustaceans and you have a predisposition to have gout, that dramatically increases your risk of having an episode. And the second is beer. If you drink beer 
particularly and shrimp at the same time, that really increases your risk of having episodes of gout. So sadly, no shrimp and no beer. It's tough. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, can you please share again the pain level of getting uh, an ACL, MCL, PCL, LCL injury in the uh, immediate phase? So, um, I meaning how painful are the injuries or how painful should it be to need treatment? I'm not sure. Uh, what right. Sounds like to me, what's the pain level like when you have those? So, between uh, one and 10, what would be the pain level is like? Sure. Let me just back up to the knee here. There we go. So as I mentioned, the MCL on the inside and the LCL, think of those injuries as a sprained ankle. It's a very similar problem. The joint gets stretched, sorry. The joint gets stretched and you can have a grade one injury, which is a minor sprain. That's uncomfortable, but not terrible. It's painful, but you can control it with ice, Tylenol, and ibuprofen. Grade two or grade three, where it's completely torn, is much more painful. It can be a very, very painful injury, but is usually controllable with ibuprofen, ice, and using a brace. That acute pain tends to subside, usually within three to five days, and then you have a milder pain which resolves over a period of a few weeks. ACL injuries, where it's torn inside the joint can also be very painful right when it happens, meaning you're playing soccer, the knee twists, you feel a pop, you try and stand up, your knee gives out, it becomes painful, swollen on a scale of one to 10. I've never had it myself, but I would imagine it's probably in the seven to eight out of 10 range, very painful, but that pain subsides fairly quickly. And usually within a week to 10 days, the pain is minimal, if any. And that's one of the weird things about the ACL injury is that the pain goes away, the swelling goes away, and after two or three weeks, you start walking around thinking, oh, maybe my knee's not that bad. You walk down the hallway, you turn quickly, and then the knee gives out and it's painful again. I hope that answers the question. Very good, I think so. Uh, next question, do you have any resources available that athletes can do to warm up, stretch before and after a game? So are there any resources, perhaps even online resources for a person to get information about stretching or warm ups before an activity? So, uh, yes, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, www.aas.org has a wonderful library of resources not only to talk about all the injuries that I've talked about today, but also about stretching and injury prevention. The other thing I would say is most gyms these days have trainers that work at the gyms and they are really, really good. And they're trained about how do you stretch and just doing one or two sessions with a trainer um, can really help in terms of learning how to perform a particular activity, whatever sport that may be, and how to stretch properly. Because you're right, just saying to someone, go stretch, well, that's not really meaningful, is it, right? Because we wanna know, well, what, is, what does it mean? How long should I stretch? How should I stretch? And that's kind of beyond the scope of today, but there are, using a trainer and AOS.org are two good resources. Very good. And the last question that we have here is about right aid, and I think that's just another, uh, uh, store like Walgreens to actually get that uh, uh, gel. Yeah, yeah, that gel that we talked about earlier for inflammation. So, um, but I think that's all the question that we have. Um, so, yeah, so that concludes then our um, our question and answer portion. Again, I would like to thank once again our speaker, Dr. William Vander Rice an orthopedic surgeon here at the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu. Also, like to thank all of you, our virtual audience, for joining us. Uh, at this time, we'd like to ask all of you, our virtual audience, to please complete the evaluation. Information is on your screen. Simply scan the QR code on your screen using your smartphone to complete the evaluation or click the URL in the chat box. Again, there's a URL in the chat box that you can also use. So we'll give you, we can give you a few mo moments for that. And again, please make sure you don't log out after you completed your evaluation.
Well, everyone, have a good day. Thank you, Avery. I think uh, everybody's done with their evaluation. Again, the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu, uh, virtual speaking of health lecture series is on the third Thursday of each month at 12 noon to 1 p.m. Please join us for the next lecture, which is scheduled for Thursday, February 16th. The topic will be a whole health approach to hip and knee arthritis. So look out for the announcement soon, and um, it will include the registration information. We hope to see you then, and feel free to share the information to your friends, family, colleagues, and anyone you think may be interested. On behalf of our COO and Senior Vice President, Darlena Chadwick, our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ronald Kuroda, and the entire Queens Medical Center, West Ohana, mahalo nui lua. Thank you very much for joining us today. Till next time, please take care and always be safe. Aloha. Mahalo.